Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture on Thursday. And we have a really special treat uh, today in the speaker, uh, Dr. Douglas Melton from Harvard. Uh, we tried to get him here not quite a year ago. And it was one of those uh, amazing moments that happens every three or four years where we had over 20 inches of snow, and it just didn't happen. Even a guy from Boston uh, could not make it here under those circumstances. And uh, if he had, I think he would have spoken to an empty room. So delighted to see all of you here, and welcome also to the people who are watching by video. Dr. Milton has dedicated himself over the course uh, of the past 20 years uh, to developing an approach that would be therapeutic uh, for individuals uh, with diabetes. His own personal story is interesting in that regard. In 1993, he was studying frog development, and his infant son uh, was diagnosed uh, with type 1 diabetes. Uh, later on, his daughter also uh, diagnosed with that same condition. And he did what a dad would do who had scientific skills. Well, OK, what can I do about this? And converted his own research interests in that direction. And over the course of the past many years, he has been devoting himself to trying to understand how one can actually differentiate cells, as in, for instance, embryonic stem cells, into beta cells that would make insulin and therefore generate an artificial pancreas made up of human cells. You would think uh, that that kind of process uh, could be worked out uh, by a dedicated group in a couple of years of just you know, adding the right cocktail well, this is turning out to be an extremely complex process of trying to convince cells to go down developmental pathways, which they do in all of us. We all have beta cells that manage to find their way uh, down those pathways into the appropriate uh, differentiated state. But uh, Doug's group has really been the one that has tried to sort out what those signals must be. And uh, all of us have been increasingly excited over the course of the last couple of years uh, to see papers coming from his group documenting that he has been able to achieve this. He will tell us that it is still a finicky bit of uh, recipe uh, construction uh, to be able to make this happen. But we are uh, clearly f much further along than I thought we could be uh, five or 10 years ago. And most of that is because of this hard work of Doug Melton. Not only does he run his laboratory at Harvard, he also founded a company, uh, Sema Therapeutics. Sema, by the way, as I understand it, <laughs> comes from the names of his kids, Sam and Emma. So Sema Therapeutics is trying to take some of these developments and turn them into an even more a rapid uh, progression into an entity that could be clinically applied for all of those individuals who would benefit from having this kind of a artificial pancreas made possible. Uh, just his credentials, uh, he did his undergraduate work at the University of Illinois um, and uh, subsequently got a PhD in molecular biology at the LMB at Cambridge University in the UK, uh, but has been at Harvard pretty much continuously uh, since 1981, uh, where he is now uh, the uh, associate member in the Children's Hospital, a biologist at Mass General. Uh, he is investigator in Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, he is a named a professor, the Cabot Professor in the Natural Sciences. Oh, I could go on. He is a Xander University professor as well. Uh, furthermore, he's been elected both to the National Academy of Sciences and uh, to the National Academy of Medicine and received numerous prizes, uh, including uh, the Joslin Medal, the Searle Scholar Award, and happy to say he continues to be a grantee of the National Institutes of Health, uh, where uh, he has also been a faithful servant in many of the things that we ask our scientists to do. So I think we're in for a treat to hear from the guy who's the furthest along in trying to tackle a problem of enormous consequence uh, for anybody who cares about diabetes. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Douglas Melton. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, <clears throat> What I'd like to talk about today, as you heard, is this idea of making pancreatic beta cells for diabetics. And that title is intended to mean two things, really. One is for transplantation, but one is to understand the disease, maybe use the cells for drug screening. And um, the way I've constructed the talk um, is relatively simple. I'm going to spend a few minutes giving you my perspective on the disease. Everyone has a different view on what diabetes is. And mine is, comes from a sort of developmental biologist perspective. 
I'm then going to relatively quickly summarize some published work and spend more than half of my talk on what I see as the challenges for the next couple of years. Um, I hesitate to say a couple of years because when I started on this, as Francis said, I thought it would only take a few years. So I don't know how many more years it'll take, but I'm going to take on the challenge of how do we get these cells into patients and how do we deal with autoimmunity. So my view of the world of diabetes is relatively simple, as I said. Um, I think the beta cell is a, if not the problem. Um, there's a picture there, a diagram of a pancreas above an islet. It's a confocal image of an islet where the blue cells are the insulin-producing cells. And in type 2 diabetes, it's well known that because of insulin resistance and other factors, there's beta cell dysfunction in about 10% of the cases leading to the requirement for insulin. In type 1 diabetes, beta cell destruction by the immune system leads to the absence of insulin production and the requirement for insulin injection. I think it's fair to say in my time in looking at this sort of tsunami of diabetes, that one major change has been people tended to think when I began that in type 2 diabetes, the beta cell might be involved, but it was unlikely to be the principal player. And now because of the work of Francis Collins and his colleagues and others from genetic studies, it's become increasingly clear the islet is important for both types of diabetes. I'm sure some might disagree with that, but let's just say for first pass, if you're interested in diabetes, you have to pay attention to the blue cell in this picture. Um, <clears throat> there I'm showing that cell going away in type 1 diabetes. And again, with my sort of Whiggish history of this subject, I would say that for insulin-dependent diabetics, injecting insulin has been the solution since the 1920s. I like this picture here. It's a picture of two tons of pig parts, which were used by Eli Lilly to purify uh, pork insulin, enough to treat about 10,000 people for one year. Um, so what advances have been made since then? Perhaps in a mean spirited way, I'll say not much. Genentech cloned the human gene. Uh, Lilly started making it. Then there were different versions of the insulin protein, fast acting, slow acting. As far as I know, Nova Nordisk's big idea was to inject it in a pen. Um, this, is, uh, this has really been the advance on diabetes treatments, and I don't mean to minimize the importance of injecting insulin, but it is not, in my opinion, a cure for the disease. The last thing I would say in that regard is when I read these sort of like biotech news, they always talk about how important it is to develop a billion dollar drug. They don't ever mention insulin because it's actually past being a drug. It's now a commodity. Um, these numbers I've listed here aren't ones that I can verify. They're from the CDC and other places, but it's estimated that two years from now, $32 billion of insulin will be injected into people. That's a lot of insulin. It's not what you'd call a blockbuster drug. So what do I want to do? I want to describe, as Francis indicated, a kind of transformative approach. And it's based on the work of others. Initially, Paul Lacey at Washington University had the idea that you should be able to transplant islets into patients and relieve them of the necessity for daily blood glucose checks and insulin injections. Here's a picture from my colleague Gordon Weir at the Joslin of human islets, cadaveric islets, ready for transplantation. And what I want to show you as a result of this, again, the work of others, is if you look at blood glucose control in a diabetic patient in the top panel A, you see that it's pretty much all over the place. Following transplantation of cadaveric islets with immunosuppression, you see their glucose control after that. So to a developmental biologist, this then becomes a very simple problem. Others have discovered stem cells that can make any part of the body. Beta cells are missing, so it's like connect the dots, make beta cells. I like to show this slide because I've been showing this slide to my lab for an embarrassing long time. It's more than 10 years and less than 20. They now call it my Skittle diagram, and they're sick of seeing it. Um, <clears throat> but the idea it was relatively simple. Let's understand how mice and humans make beta cells and then recapitulate that. Can we learn enough about the normal development of a beta cell and then use that information to direct in vitro the differentiation of human stem cells? So this diagram shows that the first step is to begin with a pluripotent stem cell, then tell it to become endoderm, making any part of the body, any part of the endoderm from the mouth to the anus then telling it to make midgut and pancreas, then telling it to make endocrine, 
and then an insulin producing beta cell, a cell that responds to glucose accurately and secretes the right amount of insulin. And those little purple dots here are supposed to be the insulin coming out in response to glucose. This is such an obvious idea. We weren't the only ones to have it, and many groups have worked on this problem. After about a decade, everyone got to this stage of being able to make a cell capable of making all the parts of the pancreas. And when that cell or that population of cells was transplanted into the kidney capsule of a mouse, three months later or so, it was possible to show human functional beta cells being made. But the field was largely stuck here about three or four years ago. That is stuck here, let's just call it the green cell stage. And you have to take my word for it, I'm not going to show you all the genetic markers for that green cell. But when I say we have a green cell, that means we assay it with antibodies and transcriptional assays to know, for example, that that cell has to express PDX1, pancreatic duodenal homeobox 1. That cell is capable of making ductal cells, asini, and all endocrine cells. So just take my word for it that we have genetic markers for these Skittle diagrams. Because that was so difficult, two of the companies working on this, one called Beta Logics and one Viacite, decided to move into a clinical trial, which they're now in the middle of, using this population of cells, some of which can become pancreatic functional beta cells after three to four months in a mouse. And we will soon determine whether or not when they put that population of cells into a device, do they similarly mature inside humans. They've transplanted them subcutaneously, and that data is now available. I think it's more than a year old, but it hasn't been made publicly available. So <clears throat> what did we set out to do? We asked, well, can we go all the way, if you like? Can we make mature beta cells? And I'll come back to the use of the word mature later, but for now, let's just say that's a cell that responds accurately to glucose and secretes insulin. This is the work I'm going to summarize, um, <clears throat> as I said, which is many years of work. We showed that you could get signals to mature those cells in vitro by co-culturing the cells with endothelia and waiting a long time. And we then went on to do all kinds of expensive transcriptional analysis. This was in the DNA chip period. And then combinatorial screening, which is a fancy way of saying we couldn't figure out the answer. We had some guesses. And so we tried to, to just screen, like empirically find out. We did that by setting up fluorescent markers for the cells and asking, can we move them from one Skittle ball to another by adding combinations of factors? For those of you who've thought about or tried these sorts of things, I'll just remind you that that's OK if you have two factors. But if you have many factors, that turns out to be a, a damnably difficult problem. What we discovered was what you might expect, is that all of the signaling pathways known by developmental biology were important for telling cells what to do. And no one of these signaling pathways was sufficient, either to stop or to move the cells along in the right direction. So if you count the number of signaling pathways there, and then imagine you have to get the right concentration in the right order, you see that quickly it's a very big and tedious problem. After a very long period of time, let me just guess and say approximately a decade, this is the protocol we published two years ago now. The, the names of the factors here don't really matter. It's all published, but some of them you might recognize, like KGF is keratinocyte growth factor, RA is retinoic acid. So you can look along the bottom there and maybe see some growth factors or small molecules um, familiar to you. For example, KIR is a Wnt pathway agonist and active in A. So what I'm going to show you now is the evidence that we solved the problem of making functional cells. But I want to pause here and emphasize that this protocol, which takes 30 to 40 days, is absolutely not unique. In other words, it is not the only way this could be done. I'm sure it can be improved. So the only point I'm trying to emphasize is that we demonstrated that it was possible. Some in the audience might be old enough to know that when we started on this, there were people who said, you can't get full differentiation in vitro because you don't have all the tissue interactions or three-dimensional structure required. You cannot study diseases in a dish by a such, such a simple-minded approach. And while those ideas are now widely accepted, they weren't, I would say, in the common um, mindset of the time. And so we weren't sure that we could do this. The second thing we set ourselves for doing, which may or may not have been a good idea, 
actually, I, some days I think it was a bad idea, is we didn't try to do this with mouse embryonic stem cells, because I sort of naively worried that if we figured it out for mouse, it wouldn't apply to the humans. So we set out to do this with human embryonic stem cells. And <clears throat> again, Francis Collins and others here at the NIH were very helpful in trying to enable that to happen at a time when the Congress wasn't so sure this was a good idea. That's sort of old history now. The second or the final part we set for ourselves, and this came from a meeting I had with Gordon Weir. I'll paraphrase what Gordon said to me. It was more or less, I'm sick of looking at papers that show one immunofluorescent image of one cell. Get real, you need a billion cells to treat a patient. So we set ourselves the goal of doing it with human cells at a scale that could be clinically relevant. To do it at that scale, we had to grow a large number of cells in suspension culture. And that, I'm going to show you a movie in a second. But that's the little kind of coffee pot size, 500 mil spinner flask we use. And we grow the cells in clusters, figuring out how to grow them that are islet size clusters. And this just shows some of the stages stained with antibodies. For example, this PDX1 gene I referred to. C-peptide is a better known marker there you see at the end uh, for insulin. And I thought I'd just show you this movie I also like to make a joke about this movie. This movie was made by an undergraduate, Mikey Siegel, who was an author on this paper. The point of the movie is to show you this scale at which things are done. So these are the ES cells beginning. That's after two hours of growth. Then after one day, we've figured out how to grow them as islet-sized spheres. And there you see at the end, some of you might see little white dots going through there. The point here is that that flask contains enough functional beta cells to treat one person. The joke I make about this movie is Mikey Siegel, an undergraduate in my lab, published as many of the undergraduates do, not published, wrote up his senior thesis, which was entitled Making Human Beta Cells from Embryonic Stem Cells. This to me is like a fantastic thing to have as your title of your thesis. So I pushed as hard as I could to get him to win the prize for the best undergraduate thesis. Of course, it didn't even come close. Someone wrote like reading Shakespeare upside down with rose-colored glasses or something, won the <laughs> best thesis. was really annoying to me. Anyway, I, I'd like to show Mikey's movie for that reason. All right, what's the evidence that we've actually made functional cells? This is published, so I'm going to go over it quickly and concentrate on the challenges. The first one shown here is that if we give multiple glucose challenges in vitro to these clusters of stem cell-derived beta cells, as I call them here, SC beta, you see insulin on the y-axis and the glucose challenges three times on the x-axis. So the idea here would be, like you could joke about it, say this is like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You give it three challenges of glucose or depolarize the membrane with potassium chloride and see insulin secretion. This compares very favorably to human cadaveric islets. And these are the cells that Viacite and others have brought into human clinical trials. But I'll remind you, this is unfair comparison in a way, because these are not fully differentiated. They're polyhormonal cells, some of which will mature three to four months later in a mouse. The other thing that's unfair about this is it's intended to make it look like these are as good as these adult primary beta cells. But let's remember, these came from a dead person. They've been on ice for a long time. They were isolated from a pancreas. So it's a pretty low bar. A real beta cell would secrete a lot more insulin that is a beta cell in one of you. OK, so the first thing is they respond to glucose and secrete insulin and only insulin. They don't secrete any of the other endocrine hormones. The best evidence, I think, um, is sort of old-fashioned evidence, is when you look at the cells, do they look like beta cells? So here's a human cadaveric beta cell in this very famous um, insulin granule with a white halo around it and this trapezoidal crystallized insulin inside, which you find many of these granules in a human beta cell. And here are embryonic stem cell-derived beta cells making the same kind of granules. And the polyhormonal or immature cells that have gone into the clinical trial are mixed endocrine granules that express at least, or have in them, at least glucagon and insulin, and perhaps other hormones. So by EM, the cells we make are indistinguishable from an adult cadaveric beta cell. What this looks like in real life, and this is my first chance to show you one of the problems or challenges, is these are the clusters sectioned. And the first pass is they're remarkably homogeneous. 
And by that I mean in each one of these clusters, in this particular case, 16.5% of the cells were the beta cells. Now it might look different, but if you think about it being on the edge like this of the 16.5%, this one might look like more, but that's just because the way it was sectioned. So the clusters are remarkably homogeneous, but not all of the cells have become beta cells. And up until now, if you're sort of half paying attention, everything I've said would imply that we were 100% efficient. We made all the cells beta cells. We did not. We've concentrated on the positive that we've made some of the cells beta cells. And we show that following transplantation, two weeks later, they reorganize themselves and form these islet-like structures. The red cells here are the few alpha cells in the preparation. The bright green are the insulin-producing C-peptide positive cells. These cells here are the kidney. These cells here are the kidney. And the polyhormonal cells, the ones viacite using, transplanted, will make some insulin positive cells. But you see a huge difference if you've already matured the cells to this point where they're functional. This is um, assays for function comparing human cadaveric islets to our stem cell derived beta cells in an immunocompromised mouse, a skib beige mouse, uh, where the cells have transplanted under the kidney capsule. So if I'm rushing a bit, it's because I'm telling you about published things. And I want to summarize that to move to unpublished work and the challenges. So let's compare the stem cell-derived beta cells to human cadaveric islets or beta cells. In terms of gene expression, they are not indistinguishable, but there's a relatively small number of genes that are different between the two. And none of them strike us as particularly important. The stem cell-derived cells make proper insulin granules. I didn't show you data we published that they respond perfectly to calcium fluxes in response to glucose, so intracellular calcium flux. I also didn't show you that they make these unusual fenestra with endothelial cells when co-cultured. I did show you that they have GSIS, glucose-stimulated insulin secretion in vitro. And in vivo, there's rapid rescue and function in mice. The last point, I might make an editorial comment that for those of you who work in this area, you know that there are lots of things that can cure diabetes in a mouse. An insulin pellet will, nearly dead cadaveric islets will, transplants. So that's not such a high bar, but it does work extremely well to make a diabetic mouse non-diabetic. So I want to focus on sort of a bigger goal in a sense now and tell you unpublished work on where we're trying to get <clears throat> Um, maybe I would call it complete mastery and dominion over this process. We want to really control this process. I want to talk about the accuracy of the glucose response, controlling all of the cell types, spend a lot of time on the efficiency, and then move to what you could say is phase two of the, of the quest to cure type 1 diabetes is immunogenicity. So let's first look at where we stand on glucose responsiveness. On the top right is a panel where in the y-axis you're measuring the amount of human insulin produced in response to low or high glucose challenges or depolarization with potassium chloride. So a low glucose challenge is in blue, a high in red, and depolarization in green. Again, this sort of previous protocol, the one that's in clinical trials, should change after three to four months after incubation in a human. That would be the hope but it certainly does change after incubation in the kidney capsule of a mouse. These are human cadaveric islets, one of the best preps we've received. Sometimes we receive preps that look like this. And this is the very best prep we have of our stem cell derived beta cells. And I want to make two points here. One, you may not be able to see it, but that number is three and that number is one. So they're secreting less insulin. And two, whether there's any response at low glucose is highly questionable. This could be just variation. Um, so whether they are responding properly is, is an open question. And this comes back to that issue I referred to as maturation. So all I'm really going to tell you now is that we're really focused in on this problem of maturation. Can we make a fully functional beta cell in vitro? Or does something important happen in vivo when you transplant it in, under the kidney capsule when it gets contact with endothelial cells? We don't know the answer to that. In fact, my thinking has changed about this a bit in that it may not be an event. It may not be like you go from immature to mature. And I was joking earlier today, like I could ask the audience to raise your hand if you're mature. 
And if you are, when did you become mature? It could be a slow process. We don't really understand this process. The other thing we want to do is to, and I'd be glad to have advice about this, is to say, why should we stop at the beta cell? Well, in type 1 diabetics, that's the key cell for sure. But mouse studies, among others, show that alpha cells are not only important for preventing you from low blood glucose, but delta cells, the somatostatin-producing cells, are clearly important for turning off the secretion of both glucagon and insulin. <clears throat> as far as I know, nobody really knows what pancreatic polypeptide does, but maybe I'm just missing important papers in the literature. And I don't care about ghrelin because that's appetite and as far as I know, at least from my own children, appetite is not a problem. So let's just say, could we make alpha and beta cells? And so I won't show you the data. We've published some of it, so have others, on making alpha cells. We're about a year behind making alpha cells as well as we make beta cells, but I want to show you some new results on making delta cells. As far as I know, no one has made these before. So by making the pancreatic progenitors and then tweaking the system, we can now make delta cells. So here's evidence using PAC6 and other markers where about 29% of the cells we can now make are expressing somatostatin. And when we use our favorite EM for this, we again see that our stem cell derived delta cells look like delta cells found in a cadaveric islet. What I wanted to show today, which is kind of a puzzle and someone can answer this in the question period or at the reception, is what should these cells do in response to glucose? So these cells secrete somatostatin at low glucose, they secrete less at high, and they can be depolarized. I can't figure out what the cells are supposed to do. No one really seems to know this because it's been impossible to get a purified preparation of delta cells to know what the answer should be. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's what we find, that at low glucose, they secrete more somatostatin than they do at high glucose. I don't know if that's the right that direction or the wrong. I think, and this may be a daring thing to say, that within a couple of years, I could come back and tell you, we now know how to make beta cells, alpha cells, and delta cells. The goal there would be to make a real islet, important for in vitro studies, and maybe equally important for the kind of transplantation that we'd like to do. So now let me move to our approach to a bigger puzzle, which is not only how do you control the cell types, but how come we can't get the efficiency up? And by efficiency, I mean, why are we making approximately 20% of the cells beta cells? What's up with the other cells? Are they not getting the message? What's their problem? Or are we not adding the right factors at the right time? We've spent a lot of time, it's probably bad practice for me to say, we've wasted a lot of NIH money trying to solve that problem. Um, we had not solved that problem by just changing the factors and tweaking the system. We cannot figure it out. And it could be because it's, I, I forgot to emphasize that there are 15 different factors at six different stages. It's a lot of combinatorics to figure out how to do that. So the first thing we started to do is to look at, say, well, could we get a clue by looking at the genes that are expressed? So what I'm showing you here is a good example of an experiment that was very difficult, cost a lot of money, and didn't really teach us much of anything. What this shows is looking at gene expression in 14 different flasks over a period of time, marching through the different stages of the differentiation process, looking at just some key genes, like OCT4 is a famous gene on in ES cells. Insulin at the bottom, obviously, a famous gene on in insulin producing cells. What this shows you in a way is this sort of variability from flask to flask, but equally important that you're dealing with populations of cells. And that just became such a hard problem for us that when we're looking at populations, we couldn't figure out which genes to use for markers. So fortunately for me, Adrian Vera's a graduate student in the lab, was one of the authors on what is now like the, the, all the craze, at least in Boston, is single cell sequencing. In fact, I think if you go to a restaurant in Boston, there's a 10% chance the table next to you will be talking about single cell sequencing. <laughs> so here's a little movie from Adrian, where many of you will know this, the point of just showing you this, is we've now really gone into this in a big way by doing single cell sequencing on adult human islets, which we recently published, 
but for the purposes of my talk today, at every stage of the differentiation, to try to get a handle on how the cells make a decision. So the data I'm going to show you is based on what you could say is 50,000 different experiments, looking at the transcripts in 50,000 different cells at different stages of development to try to understand how does a cell decide if it's going to become a beta cell. So this is the sort of goal. Um, actually, I might make a comment here with our other collaborator, Itai and I. The nice thing about this work, which we and two other labs published at the same time, looking at adult cadaveric islets, is that the cells that were discovered in the islet were known to endocrinologists for a long time. So that's sort of good news, that there were alpha cells and delta cells. So there weren't any big surprises. To me, there was one surprise, a cell I'd never heard of, just because I didn't read widely enough, called a stellate cell. Um, but other than that, if you look at the cells in the adult islet, biologists knew what was there. So that's our target. Can we make these purple beta cells there in the middle? We also found some kind of interesting facts about getting cadaveric islets from type 2 diabetics and showing some differences. But fundamentally, this set the target for us. So this is what we want to do. If we start looking at when does our process become inefficient, we're actually extremely efficient at getting to the green cells. But then things start to go off the rails. So here's a fax plot showing that at that stage, only 30% of the cells do what we want. 42% of the cells didn't respond to the factors we added. And 23% of the cells went and did something we didn't want them to do. So if you take that to the last stage, and then you ask, well, how many different kinds of cells are there? Well, here, Adrian looked at purposely one of, of a good but not a great differentiation, where nearly 20% of the cells are what we want. They express the transcription factor, NKX 6.1 and C peptide, and they don't express glucagon or other things. So this is what we want. And th there are a number of ways you could pose the puzzle of like, what's up with these other cells? What are they doing and how come they're not paying attention to what we want them to do? So by single cell sequencing, and I'm going to show you these graphs, which many of you will know now if you're reading these single cell papers, you're looking at the stochastic neighbor embedding analysis. Um, it's in this case, taking 18 dimensions of data and putting it into two dimensions. Each of the dots you see here is a single cell, and the intensity of the color is the intensity of the gene expression. And the only thing you really need to know is if the dots are next to each other, those two cells have very similar gene expression. So when we look at this top left uh, program here, you see that those NKX cells are the ones we want, but it's all those other cells that are starting to do things we won't. And we're now learning, for example, that neurogenin is expressed in this line of cells as these cells go on to do something we don't want. So what are they doing? Well, they become chromogranin positive. They turn off NKX 6.1, but they become transcriptionally polyhormonal. They're making insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. I think it's fair to say that the literature or the field is confused about whether or not those cells ever exist normally and or whether they can ever be told to just do one thing. There are very strong opinions. Mine will simply be that there's no telling experiment to distinguish those at the moment. But we don't want them. I want to get all the cells to pay attention and become beta cells. So if we look at the last stage, the first important thing we find from this is the following. We find that if we look at the cells we want, the insulin positive cells, the cells that are expressing MAFA, a mature marker for the beta cells, we found a new transmembrane protein not known to be only on insulin producing beta cells, robo2. We can see where those cells are in this. We then find the progenitors to those. These are the cells that haven't yet become purple. Let's say they're still blue, but they're on the right path. But we also find these, which are the ones we don't want. ARCS is a gene not known to many of you. It's a transcription factor. That transcription factor comes on when cells are going to become non-beta, like alpha or delta cells. So we don't want that gene on. And then we find a really weird cell population, which I'm virtually certain does not exist in vivo. It's a very stable population that divides at a low rate of replication. It doesn't exist in adult human islets. We don't have very good data on human fetal islets, but I'll bet that that cell type doesn't exist in vivo. That's sort of an interesting 
kind of finding for a developmental biologist is you can make a kind of cell which is not cancerous in the sense that it doesn't have any mutations, but it's a very stable phenotype, but it never normally exists. The computational biologists in the lab find that really fascinating. I just find it weird, but they're really interested in, in how do you make a stable kind of gene network that doesn't normally exist. So there you could see or say is our problem. We want this purple cell, the one up at the top, but we have these other cells. I've already admitted to you that we've now tried enough times by empirical tests to control the system that we're not doing much of it anymore. I forgot to say that this is extremely expensive when you do it the way we do it, because we do it in flasks, growing hundreds of millions of cells at once. So it's a 40-day protocol, and the factors alone cost $6,000 by the time you add the media and the factors. So this is a very expensive thing. So we got to stop doing that. Francis should be glad to hear. I'm going to stop wasting NIH money on that approach. So what I now want to do is, in a collaboration with the Broad Institute, is to ask, could we get a better handle on the genes by doing this experiment? This is our model for what happens, and this is what we're going to do. Can we produce a designer cell line that can only make beta cells? So this simple idea is that we want to close the door on all those other options. So even if you're, as a cell, inclined to become an alpha cell, that door is going to be closed to you. Here's how we're going to do that. We've got a virus pool which contains knockout targeting constructs for every human gene. And I should emphasize, the only reason we can do this experiment is because we do this, um, we set up our cultures at scale. You can't do this experiment in a tissue culture dish. You have to have 500 million cells if you want to do this properly. We then infect this with a virus pool and select for perturbed populations by fact, cells which have gone into one direction or the other. We then differentiate them to the stage that we want. We then separate the populations by facts, the kind of facts I showed you before, and then we do sequencing. And we ask, if you've gone in one direction or another, what genes are you missing? And we can also do this with overexpression. Where are we in this? We're at the point where Adrian has solved the problem of how to create the pool with the Broad Institute. And we've figured out how to do the viral infection at each of these stages. And we've shown we have a very highly efficient infection. So we've got the multiplicity of infection down, and we've got the sequencing down to know what construct was put, what virus was in that cell when it gets to the end of the process 40 days later. So I wish I was going to now follow with a slide to tell you the answer. I don't have the answer. I'm just telling you that's how we're going to try to solve the problem. And this is my dream, that we will knock out key transcription factors using CRISPR, maybe under inducible knockouts, and just make it impossible for cells not to go down the wrong path. Once you have that information, it should be e easy, I say easy with a smile, to do the same thing for making an alpha cell or a delta cell. So my goal would be to come back in a few years' time and say, this is how you make a beta cell, and every cell in the dish is a beta cell. This is how you make an alpha cell. This is how you make a delta cell. Then reconstruct islets for transplantation and for ex vivo studies. Now, <clears throat> with your sort of forgiveness, I'm going to assume something that's not true, which is we've solved the problem of how to make beta cells. You already know that's not completely true. There must be some good analogy, like we're in the red zone or at the goal line or something like that, that we haven't really solved it under GMP conditions, and companies are working on that. But I'm now convinced we now know how to make beta cells. And we'll get better at it, we'll get more efficient, and we'll make them more mature. I'm going to finish my talk with the second challenge, which is a little bit um, impudent, you could say, for a developmental biologist. I want to talk about autoimmunity, about how I think that could be solved and where I'd like to move my lab and others, particularly young people in the audience. Autoimmunity is a fascinating problem that I think no one really has a very good handle on. I like to ask immunologists what's the, in the Aristotelian sense, the primary cause of autoimmunity, particularly in type 1 diabetes. And I get all kinds of answers for that. Some people think it's fundamentally a problem in T cell education, in the thymus. Others think it's a beta cell problem. I contend we don't really know. 
One of the things we're doing with the help of the NIH over some years now is to try to reconstruct human diabetes by taking iPS cells from diabetics, turning them into beta cells, turning their beta cells into blood, and turning their cells, sorry, turning their iPS cells into blood, hematopoietic stem cells, and turning them into thymic epithelia. And see in this kind of circus trick way, if we can put those in a immunocompetent mouse, can we watch the disease develop? As a developmental biologist, I think that's a really good experiment. We don't have any success there yet, but I really like that idea. In the shorter term, what we've been concentrating on is a different approach. How do we block autoimmunity in type 1 diabetes? So to simplify the problem, you could say there are two things you've got to do. To, well, one thing you've got to do, you could say, is to transplant the cells we make into a human and have them survive and function. So that's like goal one. And in my dealings with many bioengineers in Boston and elsewhere, I've learned that many people first come up with a new material and then ask, how can I make use of this? I'd like to turn that around to say, here's an inexhaustible supply of cells. Can you find a material which does that, which allows the cells to survive and function? And I'm glad to say we have a number of collaborators who've taken on that challenge, that is, how do you block the immune system? And I'm going to show you the results, I think very promising results, with one of our collaborators. So there are two ways then we can think about blocking the immune system. I'll come back to biological protection, but let's just start with encapsulation. So Dan Anderson's lab at MIT has been working for years on chemically modified alginates. And I, I could give a whole talk that he should really give on how did they find this chemical modification to alginate, which seems to work very well. So actually, let me go back a slide and say what I'm going to show you is the results where we put our human stem cell-derived, ES cell-derived, beta cell-like clusters into these spheres of alginate that have a chemical modification that seems to work very well to prevent any kind of glomine fibrosis immune attack. So this result just published recently in Nature Medicine with Dan Anderson's lab, I can explain here. So we make <coughs> these immune, the key point here is these are mice that are diabetic They've been treated with streptozotizin, but the mice have a fully functional immune system. So these are not immunocompromised mice. Now, you could say, I don't care because a mouse's immune system is not a human system. I agree with you. But it's a first pass is these mice will reject human tissue if not protected. So <clears throat> with putting in blank capsules into streptozotizin-treated animals, you see here these mice have very high blood sugars. And the reason it doesn't go out past 50 days is the mice die because they can't control their blood sugar. In the green is a normal healthy mouse. And in the blue are our 250 SC beta cell clusters put in the mice. Out. These now go out way past the 175 days. I don't actually know the number. It must be more than 200 days with no demonstrable effect on their ability to control blood sugar or, dem or any demonstrable immune reaction to these clusters. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is everyone tells us that you won't be able to go into human clinical trials with this because you'd need to put in like 100,000 of these capsules. They'd be floating around the peritoneum. And until you show that they won't make tumors and or you could somehow otherwise vacuum them out and get them out, they're not going to allow that. So we need to figure out a way to put them in some kind of retrievable device. And some of therapeutics and other groups are now working heavily or actively and aggressively on trying to find a more macro device into which you could put these cells and have it retrievable to demonstrate efficacy and lack of toxicity. So my last sort of slide where I'm going to talk about our other approach is a sort of cartoon I like now, replacing my Skittle diagram with what I really think is going to be the main challenge for my lab in the next few years. Diabetics can't control their blood sugars because they have dead, missing, or dysfunctional beta cells. We can make beta cells. How do we get them into patients to control their blood sugars? I've described superficially this state of an immunoprotective device. But I and others have been really excited by the advances in cancer immunotherapy and CAR T cells and others. And so I like the simple-minded idea of making use of what two kinds of cells do to avoid immune attack, the first being tumor cells. So let's wonder out loud what would happen if you expressed PDL1 
and CTLA-4IG in these cells, what would happen? What would the T cells do? CD47. So now because everyone and their brother can do CRISPR, we're doing that. The other idea which I really like came from my colleague for many years, a person, some of you may know, Jack Strominger, an immunologist, who pointed out to me that there's this puzzle which I never thought about before of why aren't fetal cells rejected by the mother since half of their genome is the father's genome. And Jack's drawn our attention to HLA, E, and G. So we have, with Chad Cowan, knocked out the expression of class one and class two molecules and are now trying to express HLA, E, and G. I don't know if any of those things will work. Right now, our problem, curiously, is not doing the genetic modifications and not making the beta cells. It's how do you test it? Is testing it in a Xeno model really very helpful? Is that going to inform your thinking about autoimmunity? And can you get blood from a type 1 diabetic to allow you to give even a strong hint in vitro? Would an in vitro blood reaction on, you know, granular release or activation of T cells really be strong enough to then convince you that you should be able to put these genetically modified cells naked into a type 1 diabetic? I'm really happy for advice about that. You can tell my thinking is embryonic, but that's really where I want to move my activities now. So I'm going to end, as is the custom of everyone, to remind us all that I do very little of this experimental work. In fact, most of my experiments don't work. Um, <clears throat> in the black are the students who've done the work I've described to you today. And I've enjoyed um, wonderful collaborations with Gordon Weir, Dale Geiner, Dan Anderson. Now we're working with Mark Poznanski at the NIH, I mean at the MGH who likes um, expression of CXCL12 on the alginate, some of our collaborators from SEMA. And as you can imagine, I need to be writing grants all the time. I have 14 good different grants. Those are the funding agencies. But since it was nice to be invited here, I did want to give a special thanks to a couple of people and the NIH in, in several ways. First, for my entire career, I have depended on the NIH for money. I'm proud to say I've always had an NIH grant. And I have always enjoyed, particularly recently, a change I've seen in the NIH, through the NIDDK in particular. Cheryl Sato and Olivier Blondel have been the kind of NIH, I'm embarrassed, I don't know what their title is. Let's call them, they're my bosses at the NIH. And they have a wonderful way of making gentle suggestions and helping me find other collaborators without actually telling me what to do. And I think that, that's been a change in my lifetime um, then I used to say, no, you can't do this. You didn't get a grant. Now they sort of are trying to be helpful. So I don't know if Olivier and uh, Cheryl are here, but I'm really grateful to the gentle, like, invisible hand approach they take to directing me. And related to that is the formation of two consortium. Many of you won't have heard of one. was called the BCBC, the Beta Cell Biology Consortium, and now one called HERN. I'm embarrassed if I can't remember the name of it. Human Islet Research Network. Is that right? Yeah. I think these are great inventions by the NIH because they force people to work together, and I'm delighted to be part of them. Um, I wish, in fact, they funded my entire lab, so if you all like them so much, I'd like to get rid of all these other funding agencies and just, uh, like having single-payer health insurance, I'd like to have a single grantee. Anyway, let me stop there, and thank you for your attention. I'm glad to take questions. Thanks, Doug, for a really informative and right up to the minute description of what's happening in this fascinating space. We have time for questions, and please use the microphones so that people listening by video can hear, and we can start right over here. Okay. Thank First, you. just a, a comment. Now that Medtronic has approved it by the FDA, their artificial pancreas, which also measures glucose and also secretes insulin, there's going to be some competition there. The other question relates to the, the islet cells themselves. Uh, in terms of tumors relating to islet cells, we have islet cell tumors or other endocrine tumors that secrete insulin. Are those of any use to you in terms of maybe perhaps engineering them down uh, in terms of then suitability for transplantation and then be able to put them into people with a little bit better results than starting to with, with stem cells themselves? Yeah, those are both um, two good questions. Thank you. Let me see if I have a slide to tell you why I don't believe the dual hormone pump is going to work as well. Um, 
I think I do. No, I can't, I can't do it. Um, I'll just tell you that the best evidence from Ed Damiano and Paul Russell on the dual hormone pump, if you look at the glucose excursions, is that it's much better than a monohormonal pump with and without the glu continuous glucose monitor. But still, if you look at how much time the patient's blood sugars are kept out of the good range, it's competing with how many millions of years of evolution. A beta cell reads blood glucose every millisecond. Those pumps, those monitors read it, I would think, in the best case, every few minutes. I, I shouldn't ever say Google won't be able to solve this problem, because I would never have believed Google would let you look at any street of America on the Google map. But I'll just say that I'm going to vote on the natural solution. Um, I'm delighted by the dual hormone pump and the continuous glucose monitor. That'll be an improvement for patients. But their blood sugars are not controlled in the normal range. Your second question was, should we have taken a different approach? Maybe tried to slap an insulinoma around and get it to behave better, OK? That's a, a reasonable idea. And sort of related to the idea is, why should we have to go through a 40-day procedure? If Yamanaka shows that you can turn a fibroblast into an ES cell with four genes, why can't we begin with an ES cell and add eight genes and turn it into a beta cell? I'm very interested in that problem. Um, I'd first ask someone, what are the eight genes, and how would you find them? Um, we know there's about 1,000 genes that are turned off and about 800 that are turned on comparing an ES cell to a beta cell. So I don't disagree with your idea. Why didn't we try this other thing? I guess I'd say life is short, and you have to place a bet on something. I'm a developmental biologist, so I placed a bet on trying to turn an embryonic cell into a beta cell rather than trying to turn a dysfunctional cell into a beta cell. But if you want to do it, more power to you. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Doug. Uh, thanks for a great talk and uh, kind words about NIH administrators. Um, I really like the, the last five minutes of your talk, this business of equipping uh, uh, beta cells with uh, a defense mechanism that may not even exist in a beta cell in the first place, but to fight uh, autoimmunity, for example, the kind of tricks that cancer cells use. Uh, if we push that argument uh, all the way, one uh, wonders why you would actually need to, to transplant cells, right? I mean, you could theoretically use some sort of, um, mm -hmm. you know, gene therapy approach to actually protect the beta cell mass that's already there, even in, in diabetic people. So, so do you see a, a time when actually uh, re-implanting cells in individuals may not even be needed? And what, what, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. about using the regenerative capacity of, of, of the pancreas itself? Yeah, that's a, a great point. Thank you, Olivier. Um, I would say that, first of all, by the time some diabetics are diagnosed, their residual beta cell mass is likely to be insufficient. And so you'd not only have to protect those cells, you'd have to get them to replicate, which is a separate problem that hasn't been solved. But um, I'd, I'd also remind the audience, I don't need to remind you, that I'm already asking a lot of the FDA if I want to put in a ES cell that's been turned into a beta cell. Now I'm adding genetic modification, which is doubly bad, right? It, should it go to the gene group or the cell group or the device group? Um, you're saying let's do gene therapy in a person with probably multiple genes and injecting something somehow into their pancreatic islets. I'll just remind you then that the challenge there is of the, the tissues in the body you don't want to touch, maybe the brain ranks number one. I would guess the pancreas ranks as second because anytime you touch it, you cause pancreatitis and make a lot of trouble. So getting the genes into the islets could be a, a real challenge. But I like, uh, you're a good example of what I said, of thinking big. Why stop at cell transplantation? And then that brings us uh, away from something I don't think about. I think about treatment, but we should think about cure or prevention. I haven't ever really thought much about prevention. I just think about treatment. Yeah, thank you. So. One thing I'm, I'm curious about is all those other cell types in the islet. So you, know, you, you emphasize that what you really need is the beta. But if you, if for example, you take the, you know, the masses you make, the synthetic islets, if you have just the beta cells and say by sorting, get rid of everything else, does that work as well as, uh, mm. as the mixture does? Mm. That's a great question. And um, we, don't, we haven't been able to do that experiment. The reason one's focused on beta is from the work of many others over years that in a type 1 diabetic, 
that's really the only cell that they can say is missing and dysfunctional. There's still other cells of the islet present. They change in number and they shrivel up kind of like a raisin after a while, but on the whole, it's the beta cell. And also I'll remind you, it's quite amazing the fact that you can inject insulin. You don't have to inject insulin into the pancreas. You can inject it into your butt or your stomach, anywhere, and it works. And so that makes you confident that if you provided a little cell that measured glucose and squirted out insulin, you may not have to put it anywhere special. You might be able to put it anywhere. So that's the argument for the f initial focus on the beta cell. Having said all that, my intuition is that it won't work as well as an islet would. Mm -hmm. And the human cadaveric transplantations were not beta cell transplants, those were islet transplants. Right. So no one has ever put pure beta cells actually into any animal and said, is that sufficient to control blood sugar? Because no one's ever had pure beta cells. Did that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So along that same yeah. line, uh, Doug, how critical, though, is the portal circulation? You just sort of said, well, it probably doesn't matter too much where you put the beta cells, but don't we have some evidence that if you really want completely normal physiological situation, uh, those beta cells ought to be in the portal circulation and not in the peripheral circulation? Or is that just uh, an idea that people have promoted? I think it's, a, it's an idea um, more than there being strong evidence. But there's no doubt that the portal circulation is key and that that works normally, but whether that's required is unclear. Huh. Um, one of my favorite surgeons who works on this, Camilo Ricordi in Miami, likes the omentum as a source for transplant because it's so well, well who vascularized. Who wouldn't like the omentum? I mean, right. it's a pretty special place. <laughs> yeah, um, but then I guess you remind me that we should all remember where do we titrate, how would you put it, um, what does it say? We don't have to have a perfect solution. Insulin injections work, they don't work well enough. We may not have to have perfection. My goal would be that people wouldn't have to prick their fingers and inject themselves with insulin or use an insulin pump, and importantly, not worry any more than you or I do about what we ate and how much exercise we do. That may not be a perfect solution, but that's sort of my dream. Well, yeah. That's a nice way to yeah. sum up, and a worthy goal indeed it is. Please, let's thank uh, Dr. Doug Melton again. <laughs> Thank you.